thanks for that um, uh, introduction. So, I'm not quite sure. Let, let me put it in plain, ling- plain English. Um, at the end of the day, the first paper was can you was about can you actually pick different pasture types using a satellite so that we can understand the feed base on our farms and move our livestock accordingly. The second paper was can you sprinkle something on your farm dam to reduce evaporation by 30 to 50 percent. The third paper was about uh, can we put a sensor on an animal so that we can remotely monitor them for their health and or, uh, for example, internal parasite burden. And the last one was, can we estimate the amount of carbon in our trees on our farm because we can make money out of it? So um, thank you for the, uh, for the official introduction to those papers. But at the end of the day, they all have an end in mind. And it's a really interesting point that you raise that um, at the end of the day, we've got a, an amazing rich and diverse community of people who want to do research to grow our agri-food sector, to grow your business, and we need a lot of guidance and a lot of help. I'm wearing the tie I wore at my very first shed meeting 25 years ago, and I think the more we get our scientists out into shed meetings into local communities like this, the better. So anyway, my name's David Lamb. I have a lofty title, Chief Scientist. Uh, before I tell you a little bit about my organisation and me, I guess I just wanted to echo the, the acknowledgements today. So certainly thank you to the sponsors, um, AAMIG, FarmBot and RPL. Thank you to the um, Advancing Ag Advisory Committee team uh, for inviting me up. I really enjoy these opportunities and they are so valuable to me and hopefully we can be put to better use back for you. So James, Russell, Anna, Belinda, Linda... Lachlan, it's great to have a fully engaged and um, and respected uh, uh, member of parliament here because uh, as part of my conversation around angels of change, we're going to need you. Um, Leonie, thank you. I, I actually got you right this time again. Uh, welcome. Um, Elton, Paul, Neil, Lou and Dave Phelps. Dave, I think you probably understood those titles of those papers, but, but maybe not many others because uh, you've been in this game for many years. Look, um, I'd also like to acknowledge other distinguished guests this morning, for example, our showgirls. And and a key part of what I want to talk to you about this morning is the issue of agents of change. So Anna, Lily, Paige and Alice, uh, welcome. And of course, our rural ambassador, Alicia. You are the agents of change. You are the agents of messaging. And um, and without you, our future is going to be, and your colleagues and your ilk, our future is going to be fairly, fairly mainstream. So what is food agility? Let me just briefly echo the earlier comments. So I represent a cooperative research centre and um, uh, known as Food Agility CRC. Um, it's, uh, it's got two roles. One is to help put our shoulder to the wheel to transform the agri-food sector. But the other one is to change the way researchers and ideas carriers do business. You know, there's a lot of people sitting in ivory towers with great ideas, but until you put them into action on the ground and get feedback as you go, then at the end of the day, they live and die as ideas. So it's the way we do business. It's really important. And startups, small businesses, medium businesses, corporates are all part of our lifeblood. In fact, the CRC um, is noted for a couple of key features. We've got eight universities and a couple of um, state government uh, organisations, including DAF, uh, as our partners because that is our research capacity. That's our capacity to, to create these new ideas and, and push the boundaries. On the other side of the equation, we've got industry partners ranging from the finance end of town, which is an interesting new mix when it comes to ag tech innovation, as well as companies that are involved in developing and rolling out technology and organisations that are, that are involved in using them. No project goes out our door that hasn't got at least an industry driver who will slap the table and say, I will use what come out comes out from our endeavour and more importantly, I'll pay for it. A technology provider that will be the ultimate delivery platform on which our outcomes appear at the end user and, of course, the research component. So it's a slightly different approach to CRCs. Um, it's a challenge. It's a challenging way to do things, but we've got 10 years to have a crack. Okay, me, I'm from Armidale in the New England. And so, you know, my quintessential home is, is very much with our feet on the ground in the bush, the same here, okay? So, um, so we are very much into the farming game. Uh, we probably have a serious crack at hats compared to up here. I thought you guys were supposed to have big hats. Our rule of thumb is if the hat's no bigger than your horse, you're okay. So, um, but of course, 
there's no difference really. We are, we have our feet on the ground. This is quintessential long reach. To be honest, I think at the moment, we've just moved on to level five water restrictions. I suspect that's more like us. And now this is more like you guys. So, you know, the climate and our environment is, of course, ultimately important. What are the questions of our time? Well, why does the future of agri-food hang in the balance? Well, at the end of the day, what are the three main forms of capital we've got to develop on? And I think this gathering here this morning is a key is a key indicator. Clearly, we're into the production game, you know, livestock, crops, and so forth. But the other forms of capital that are really important to us are our natural capital assets. And the land we're on, the health and resilience of our landscapes, and of course, the drought throws up right up into the air uh, for scrutiny. But also our human capital in this room, in this in this uh, in this tent. I'm delighted to see myself at the top end of the age group in this tent. That is so cool. Um, it's the young people that really matter. And at the end of the day, you know, what are the drivers of our businesses? It's about producing the right thing at the right place at the right time for the right people when they want it. It's about in, uh, leveraging off the market value of what we produce, things like Brand Australia, local provenance, all these things are really important. It's about capital investment. And you know, the reason the finance sector is, is looking very closely and wanting very keenly to buy into this area is because you know they have money, we want money. They want to manage the risk associated with that finance, but we want to be rewarded for doing things right. We don't want to be rewarded just for having a healthy balance sheet. We want to be rewarded for the health of our landscapes and the fact that we are regenerating our landscapes and our systems while we're doing it. That doesn't appear on the balance sheet at the moment, and it should, and I'm, I'm heartened to see that looking at trajectories in current investments, that it will. And of course, we have to value and grow our human capital. And, um, and, and ladies, the one, the, those of you that I acknowledged earlier, you're a key part of that, which I'll touch back on shortly. As producers, you know, we want to produce sustainably and get the best out of what technology has to offer. It's about managing our feed base, water. It's about managing our natural capital because that is something that will appear on our balance sheets. It's about things like labour and any other inputs that hit us at the, uh, at the hip pocket. In regions... We've got to grow things that, that get the best out of what our regions have to offer. Now, consider the New England. I can't finish tomatoes in my garden. We're now on level four water restrictions, yet we've got some of the largest greenhouse productions, production systems for tomatoes, for example, in the country. And in fact, one of our local towns, which has 100 days of water left, and it's going to take 184 days to build the pipeline to them to save them, is licking its lips looking at the nearby greenhouse uh, setup because they are completely self-sustainable and they've got all their own water because of the way they've managed their water, the way they recycle it and repurpose it. So you never know what you can get the best out of your region for. It's not necessarily just open air farming. Bear that in mind. And of course, we've got some wonderful startups and, um, and organisations now here in this region that are making a difference. James, sorry about the photo for you, but I managed to pick one without your beard on so you can recognise it. You know, and at the end of the day, how do we translate these ideas into the marketplace, creating solutions that solve problems that people will want to buy? And it's about integrating the ideas with the marketplace and the users. And it can be anyone from smart services providers backed by technology like the uh, AgriHive, for example, a local product, technology builders that want to deploy sensors and gadgets on our farms for purpose, and of course, how we integrate it together. We've got a marketplace here. We've got businesses that are really quite famous, punch above their weight in their name, right? And at the end of the day, they're producing on the back of local produce. And at the end of the day, how can we assure that, um, that customers are getting what we promised them? Be why? Because I'm getting the raw materials that I've been promised. So, and, and at the end of the day, how do we scale up on that and build our businesses, our local businesses, to, to, to punch above local servicing the needs of our local area, move into our regions, move into our state, into our country, and then offshore. And of course, as a consumer, you know, one in three forks of food that we put on our mouth is tied inextricably to some sort of digital process. And as consumers, we then really want to know, you know, where does my food come from and how is it produced? We've had the recent honey scare, 
we had the recent dis discovery that uh, 20,000 bottles of supposedly Penfolds wine sold in China didn't even come from Australia. In fact, 50% of the wine sold in, in China uh, with an Australian label doesn't come from Australia. And of course, we've got, uh, we have an export market that is hungry for our product, but they want to know that what they're eating is our product, not someone slips some dirty rubbish in there with our brand on it to command a 10% premium. We already know that Australian beef can go from the mid 30 cents per kilo um, up to mid 50 cents per kilo, just by knowing, by our end user knowing that it did come from Australia, it did come from this region, for example, and knowing with some certainty. And of course, we've got regulators who want to keep an eye on things, not to control us, but to, to actually help us uh, in the way we run our systems. And at the end of the day, digital sits at the heart of that. We have our finance sector that want to give us finance, reward us for our production system behaviour and manage risk. But at the moment, the way we manage our land does not impact on their decisions to provide us finance or to provide us uh, various risk management tools because it doesn't appear on the balance sheet outside of your cash flow, profit and loss statements. So we need and we have an opportunity to bring that richer diversity of information from our properties and our business systems into the mix to our benefit. And of course, at the end of the day, as producers, um, we are producing food, right? And so there's a challenge and an opportunity here. Every product should have a name attached to it, should have a story around it, because people want to know. So the language now that's emerging is around decommoditization and premiumization. They're words I didn't even understand until I Googled them up about uh, six months ago. At the end of the day, each and every one of us are producing a fundamental unit of food which has value over and above just shoving it in trucks and sending it out the farm gate. So it's something that we should look at. And data can play a role in this. Now, we are facing a data-rich future. So let me just tell you this, and we've got to get our heads around this. Okay, by 2025... The, the globe will be generating about 175 zettabytes per, per annum. That's 10 to the 21. So that's 10 with a lot of zeros after. Okay. Now, here's the other point. By 2020, so by next year, it's estimated the average person will, will conduct about 5,000 digital interactions per day. That's one every 18 seconds. Now, I don't see myself doing it, but I can see my 17-year-old son doing it now. So, you know, at the end of the day, we're talking about a lot of data being generated. 175 zettabytes. Look, as far as I can understand it, you take a HD DVD Blu-ray disc, you can actually stack them one on top of each other here at Longreach and reach the moon. Actually, 25 times. So that's the amount of data that's going to be generated per annum in the globe. This is a data lifestyle and therefore the data economy that we're going to be facing, we're moving into. And, but farming is no exception. In a review conducted in 2016-2018 for the federal government, I was part of the team, but it was a much bigger team than me, we were able to demonstrate that we can actually grow the gross value of production of Australians' agri-food sector by 25% if we can unlock the power of digital. Things like automation labour savings, genetic gains, tailoring inputs to needs, market access and biosecurity. These are big gains that we can make if we can unlock the power of it to everyone in that se in our sector, right? A 25% increase. And the thing is, when we're talking digital ag, we're not just talking about farmers, we that produce the food. Everyone's in the game and everyone's going to be connected to us. Not just our value chain down to the consumer, but also the finance insurance sector, digital agronomists, technology providers like Farmbot, we heard from Rachel earlier regulators technology, uh, and researchers. Everyone is going to be inextricably linked. That's what digital can offer us if we get in it and, and do it right. But it's not easy. We surveyed a thousand producers around the country two years ago. Of the producers that have already got some form of digital tech on our farms, three quarters rated as moderate to extremely challenging to keep the stuff alive. Half of the people that are deploying technologies have taught themselves. It is now really valuable that our providers, FarmBot is an example, our providers are out there playing the education game. And clowns like me get wheeled out as well. When we, of, of the 1,000 farmers, over 600 producers we surveyed actually didn't realise what opportunities are out there, what technology options are available. And I'll come back to that one, that point again a little shortly. 
If we're going to ultimately move to a digital agri-food sector, the reality of the situation is, is that we that are currently in the system have got to adapt. But the ultimate agents of change in this are, the, are our youth, our young'uns. Okay? We've got to get in early, get to our kids early. You know, how many kids, how many of our sons get given a little plastic John Deere tractor to fool around with? Hopefully now our daughters get the same. But they should be now be given access to the fact that you can program auto steer tram lining on a little plastic toy with your smartphone. You know, and these are things we take to the Royal Easter Show, for example. Right? But it's it's all ages. You know, when we run field days, and as you do here, look at the age spread. You know, we it's not surprising to see an 85 year age range sitting down having lunch at Smoko um, through any of these ag engagement things that we're involved in, and you yourselves. But ultimately, our agents of change are our youngins. And we have to engage with them. We have to engage with them. Now, I noticed and I'm heartened to see that with the Advancing Ag Advisory Committee, there's already talk around a young dimension, 18 to 35, a subcommittee in that area. Fantastic. I would suggest we've got to go to the very young as well. Get the young kids in right from the beginning and help them become part of the agent, the process of change. You know, and, and get them in front of ministers. Uh, get them in front of the media. Get them in front of each other. It's really important. They need to be heard and we need to listen. And when I look now at the wonderful opportunity you have in this region, you know, look at the Pastoral College campus and the, and the current transition process that's underway. I hark back to our own UNE Smart Farms that I helped found it in five years ago. We had a 7,000 acre property that was about to hit the market. It was going to get sold out from under us. So what we did was we jumped on the opportunity of the day, which was, and this is a wave. Ag tech is a wave. So jump on it. You know, we built an innovation centre. The council got so sick of people ringing them up saying, where is this innovation centre that they threw in all the waypoint, wayfinding signage, um, tarred the road and put in a couple of bridges so the school buses wouldn't spear off down the gullies. We've now got students accessing technology on site while we farm the country. Sure, you get clowns like me giving talks about what's new and news, but what's really important is we have local innovators that we want to get in front of our people and do it here. Get them out on the place, let them see how it lives and breathes and let them see the technology in action in a meaningful way. You can have space age command centres like we've got, but at the end of the day, that's just agri-porn. What really matters is people engaging with it at a meaningful level. And the e-beef project is something I would really commend because at the end of the day, that is an integration of this sort of smart farm thinking with real farms in real life scenarios. This is the reality of our life. But at the end of the day, you know, I look at what we have here as an opportunity for the region. You, we can innovate, we can educate, and we sure as hell can influence. But if I may be so bold to offer some advice, don't sit around waiting for things just to run its course. Get in early. We have a member here who is proactive and engaged, and uh, let's go tap the doors of our state, um, our state agencies, our governments and unlock some resources and create something that sets this region apart that people will come to from all over the country. And if they can't come here, export it. Export it into our classrooms all around the country. All of our high schools, all of our primary schools are now connected via various forms of broadband. Bring it into them, into their own lounge rooms and into their own classrooms. So I'm, I'll be a really keen uh, advocate of whatever you want to do, but get your fingers out and do it, because once the door shuts at the end of the year on it, maybe a little late. There you go. And if I look at what matters in the region, if I look at the, at the government's commitment to doubling production by 2040, you know, these are, these are no, this is no new news. These are the same problems we've all got. Best practice in conservation farming, irrigation, water use efficiency and machinery deployment, clearly climate adaption, sustainable grazing land use, natural disasters, biosecurity threats. Talking to Dave, who's a researcher like me, now out there on the ground dealing with you know, the, the issues around the floods to the west, okay? So we've got people that are that are doing research at the same time providing local and regional leadership. Um, the beef industry is the heart of, of, of this region for sure. Science and tech capabilities. Just because you haven't got a university here doesn't mean you're not connected. In fact, you've got a great community of universities around this state, just for starters, and I see that uh, Long Reach um, Ag Innovation um, Outreach Centre as a key part of moving that forward. It also drives your collaboration. We've got issues with weeds up here. Well, you should go to the New England. We're feeding our cattle on weeds at the moment. And of course, feral animals. So I've got a couple of examples of what's new and news in, in most of those areas. 
what we're finding now is there's a massive amount of data being generated by technologies like satellites. And that's been going on since the mid-70s, but what's different now is it's accessible. You can get a lot of it for free. You can get a lot of value out of it by using the freemium products as a starting point. And for example, we've got uh, producers in our neck of the woods using some of this freely available data to look at the resilience of our landscape, indicators of landscape health, and trajectories of landscape health over time. Is it going up or is it going down? Our finance partners are interested in that. But there are products now like Farmat 4D, which are now ca covering substantial components of our agricultural production systems. And you've got local products, you know, data farming, for example, initiated out of Toowoomba with Tim Neal. They're covering 5 million hectares almost as well. And I would commend you to just go online and have a look at products like these. They offer a start point. Have a look at your place on it. Does it make sense? Well, wow, that's interesting. Maybe I should um, look at going the next step with that sort of product. And for example, on our own farm, we took some of those key products that are free and we were able to complete a carbon biomass map of the farm and estimate that we've got about 265,000 tonnes of above ground biomass carbon on the farm. Now that's an interesting number. Can we do it for every farm? Can you do it for your own farm? Why? Because that's something you can trade. That's something you can make money out of potentially by looking after. We also know that if we change some of our land management approaches, we can realise about another 140,000 tonnes of, of, of additional carbon storage potential. Ooh, maybe setting aside land. Is it more productive for me and my balance sheet to set aside land and, ha and transact on that, as opposed to uh, flogging it with cattle, for example? I don't know, but what I'm getting at is these are the sorts of things you can drive some of these free-to-air tools towards if you want to give it a go. We can be better off doing that too. There's some research out now that shows that if we do, if, if we look at the um, resilience of our landscape and we take on sort of the regenerative approach to farming, it's good for our health as well, which you might be interested in. So this is not just about tech, this is about what tech can do for us. You know, there was a, um, um, Jackie Brown and, and a team just at the end of last year published some science, so I've got to give you the odd little paper that shows that those farmers, and this is a really cool photo, that's the same photo taken... Uh, about uh, 30 years apart, and um, can show that if you practice some form of regenerative farming, what that means is up to you and those that matter to you, you know, you will feel better about it. You will actually be able to cope more with what nature has to throw at us. And you'll be way more satisfied with your health. So, you know, there's some actual medical reasons why we should get into this game as well. And it's more than just the health of our landscapes. The sort of tools that are available now give us an opportunity to make tactical decisions. Tools that allow us to monitor our feed base. I noticed the eBeef project has that as a key part of it, their integration. Allows you not only just to work out your production efficiencies, but to plan ahead, to manage your feed gap, but also at a tactical level, just to keep livestock moving around so you keep grazing within the band that matters to you and your system. And there are tools now that placed in the hands of our farmers can help them not only do measurements that matter to them on the ground, for example, we've done a fair bit of work on little handheld pasture biomass tools, but while they're using it, we can be harvesting up that data to smarten up the algorithms behind the scenes, crowdsourcing. Every time a farmer does a local calibration so that they convert the, meeting for the measurement from that little handheld wand to a biomass measure, we get the data as well. Not because we want to keep an eye on them, but because we want to provide them back smarter products uh, on the back of that, or hand those algorithms over to our tech developers so that they can develop smarter products. We're not in the IP game, uh, we are in the, uh, the, the ideas generation and rollout game. And of course, as we heard from Rachel earlier, water matters. I mean, from where I sit, there are two orders of magnitude difference in water prices, depending on where you are relative to your rainfall. Now that matters and that hurts, depending on where we are. That, those numbers can flip in three years' time. In the New England, we, we're about five weeks from any drought. If we miss rain uh, for a month, we're buggered for the season, as we are this coming season. And, but it's the same up here. You miss good rains, suddenly the price point will flip. So that's why we've got these digital tools. It's about camera systems. UC is another group from, uh, fr from up here, up north that have got uh, camera systems for monitoring our water points. You can tilt, pan and zoom the camera around to read the gauges on your pump. You don't need to wire up your pump with a million things. Just turn the camera around and read the dial. It says oil pressure and or temperature and or pump rate. 
we've got these small devices, the so-called um, um, LoRaWAN type uh, devices, capable of transmitting signals tens of kilometres. And companies like Taggle, for example, which originally got into the game of putting these devices on water meters so that the councillors can remotely read your water meters, are now covering noticeable areas of the country in terms of the networks they're rolling out for producers and producer groups. And, um, and I have to admit, I, I enjoyed listening to this clip on the radio the other day um, when uh, one of the farmers rang in and said, look, we're always in the New England moaning about our water, but uh, it's so dry here that we've had to institute a buyback uh, scheme for our water pistols. At the end of the day, water really matters. And as Rachel alluded to earlier, we've got satellite direct systems. We don't have to get wrapped around mobile phone networks, though it's hard not to, and it's something that we still need to focus on. But satellite direct systems like the FarmBot, we've done a little bit of work ourselves over the years with Miriota, and um, you know these are really important for keeping an eye on things. But, but Rachel raised a really interesting point. You do this so that your cattle don't run out of water. You do this so you're not wasting water because it costs a, costs a lot or you're running your bore systems and you've got bore runners that are spending time and drawing salary to monitor the bores. We did a trial in the Western Kimberley, and, um, which has 40 bores in running, in operation, and, um, and that trial basically saved six days a week of the bore runners' time. Go visit the bores that need it. Don't go to them if they don't need it. But what really matters is a peace of mind piece. So, for example, um, Rexy here is a producer in southern WA, went on his first ever holiday during a dry spell and um, posted on Facebook a, his wife did a capture of him checking his tanks. That's what matters. Right? Um, Brad Wooldridge from a place called, uh, from, from a place called Arthur River, um, which is down south, same deal, on holidays, checking stuff. This is what matters. If uh, I did an interview with a guy called Darren Lee about two years ago. Darren Lee is a Grains Research Development Corporation anointed leading farmer. He's got one of the best wide up farms in the country for managing his mixed farming and grains operation. And when I asked him, why did you get into it? Why did you get into connecting everything up on your farm? Cameras on your way, bridges to watch people in the yards, to watch people in your chemical sheds, to watch people uh, and data flowing from various senses. He said, I got into it because I love fishing. I've got an eight year old son and I want to take him fishing more. Let's get to the key drivers of why we need to do this. Production, sure but we're in it for a lifestyle as well and a livelihood and we want to survive in it. Technology can play a big role in that. And everything can speak to us. We are now in the position of life where we can become the Dr. Doolittles thanks to te technology. We can create living and breathing soil moisture maps for our farms and with that we can even estimate our pasture growth rates to ridiculously high levels of accuracy, almost um, to the point that we've got to have a double and triple look at it. So, for example, we know that in a monoculture pasture in our neck of the woods, we can estimate pasture growth rates within a couple of kilograms per hectare per day based on this sort of data. Now, that's driving the system hard, but this is what technology offers us if we can populate our landscapes with them, and they are getting cheaper. You put something simple as a set of way scales on a beehive, and you can literally watch every day the bees leaving the hive to go and collect their nectar or pollen to produce honey. Now we've got um, 10,000 beekeepers in Australia with about on average 50 hives apiece. They would spend 80% of their time driving to beehives to check them and have no idea what they're going to find there. Yet in here is the precursors of colony health, honey flow and even here a precursor signal to swarming. Now we don't have any registered beekeeper businesses in this region. You've got 11 over next door in, in Fitzroy. That's cool. I reckon those 11 beekeepers would be pretty chuffed because they would spend a lot of time on the road. So everything starts talking to you when you wire it up and the technology is coming cheaper. And of course, so too will our livestock. And there is a lot of talk, a hell of a lot of talk about livestock tracking this, livestock tracking that. Now we've been in the game of doing research in this space since the um, late 90s and there is a lot of momentum and now there's a lot of early look technologies coming on the marketplace. You know, the, the, the AWI led DigiBale, Embedded vet, which is a little chip you can put in your cattle to measure movement through accelerometers, to measure temperature, to measure heart rate so you can get to health. And we've got long range chips as well. So yeah, we know the technology is shaping up. I, I wouldn't suggest go buy it now. Give it a couple more years to stabilize because a lot of these businesses that are running them out now are in startup phase. If you can get yourself on a trial and learn with them, fantastic. 
and it's coming. A couple of years from now, I said five years, three years ago, I reckon we've still got two years to run, so I'm not changing my trajectory. This stuff is coming to us. Um, because the technology is evolving as well as the sensors, the communications technology. We can now go from what we used to do only five years ago, which was have collars collecting data, then you've got to scruff them down to get the damn thing off them and read them, to now these chips that can transmit many kilometres. And that's really valuable because now we can do, we're doing trials collecting that data from remote, far-flung areas and over large-scale landscapes. So, you know, it's a very exciting space and keep an eye on it and get yourself involved in any trials. For example, eBeef is a classic example. If they develop that, Dave and team, get in on it because it's a great way to learn from the ground. From the ground. Because it's all going to feed our dashboard. So walkover weighing systems now are, are, are increasingly appearing on our farms. They've gone now from trial phases. I know half a dozen producers that have bought them and that are running them. Sure, there's some lessons to learn on the way. But yeah, we can get our mob weighing done. You know, So this is a 24-hour count for a place called Burley, which is up near Charters Towers. And this is data flowing into Armadale in the New England. Okay, We can do that stuff. But now the technology is allowing us to monitor feed supplements, lick blocks. So we can actually count the animals at the block. We can even watch the block consumption over time on a daily basis. So it doesn't take much to go from one piece of equipment, like a walkover way, to now some sort of other important uh, input such as feed supplementation. And our, we ourselves are part of the mix. We are ourselves are part of the Internet of Things. Being able to monitor ourselves and our colleagues while we work. Uh, not to see if you're flogging the quad bike around the paddock, and I've got to give you a warning, which will happen anyway. As I often get, a lot of speeding alerts come on my phone, and I know the clown that does it. Um, but also, you know, are you okay? Okay? Really important. And of course, drones. Drones, drones, drones. We can all buy these things from 200 bucks upwards. All right? You can buy yourself a really nice drone for 1500 bucks. You pull it out of the box, you shake it, you fly it, you think this is cool and then it goes back in the box because you haven't quite thought out a thing to do with it. So I love to see dusty, clapped out drones in the back seat of people's utes and you do see them, certainly out in the cotton country where I do a bit of work, I've got a lot of cotton producers using it. You can do some really cool stuff with drones that actually make a difference. Scouting troughs that might save you um, half an hour on and off that damn bike or in and out of that side-by-side -side opening gates just to get through with three paddocks to go check troughs. Send it out on the scout. I confess I do push the odd roo off the oak paddock in the morning with it. Um, uh, I've got a few lying around in the paddock, I might say, I haven't got drones, that is, that I haven't quite found yet. Little things that matter. But they can and will be doing useful things. Already people are developing algorithms that just, that just allow you to use a normal RGB camera on your little DJI drone or equivalent to identify and map out weeds, to give you a weed map in, uh, uh, an infestation using machine learning, artificial intelligence, which my father always said is no substitute for natural stupidity. But at the end of the day, we can get it, we can get to it now. It's coming. A simple, a simple $1,000 drone can actually estimate your pasture biomass to within a couple of hundred kilos per hectare, which is equivalent to a pro grade trained producer. There's still work to be done. But we've got early indicators that those drones can give us that information, the stuff you buy off the shelf. Um, but also, we'll be able to move things and control things if we can monitor them. So virtual fencing is something we're hearing a lot about. We estimate there's about 5 million kilometres of fencing around Australia, and you've got to turn that over every 20 years. That's a, that's a $5 billion investment uh, when you look at the national asset. So the ability to control animals, to move them from parts of the paddock remotely, is something that's getting people's interest. The CSIRO is driving a, a lot of work in that, but there are others in that space as well. We've done trials, for example, with sheep, showing that you can exclude them from paddocks, drop the fence, and within 24 hours, they're back in the paddock again. CSIRO are doing work on how it takes to, trans to train animals. So here's a paddock. You virtually apply the fence. You remotely apply the virtual fence on a collar with, a, with an e-tag, and within 48 hours, you've got more than 40% of them excluded. Um, after 90 hours, you pretty well got the whole thing excluded. And then you can start moving the fence remotely. It's just a GPS command, and the animals can be brought back into that. So there's a lot of work going on in how, you, how we can control animals using third-party technologies around their necks, for example. Dairy industry are interested, but you know, you've got to start somewhere. It'll be, it'll be up into this open space country soon, so keep an eye on it. A lot of technology that's now shaping up in front of us is going to be really data rich. 
you know, what used to be a $25,000 LIDAR, which is a light version of what the police use to check your speed, um, that we use inside caves to map the features of a cave, that we scan inside pyramids to look at where things are and, and there's wonderful new discoveries, can, well, are now down to, you know, $5,000. And these things can be set on fence posts so that every time an animal walks past, you capture the full measure of that animal. It's three, it's three dimensions. You know, if it's sheep, it could give you an indication of the wool load. If it's animals, it could give you an indication of frame score. Who knows? We've got poultry farmers now that are able to monitor thousands and thousands of birds in sheds remotely. Now, we want to take someone like Guy Hebblewhite here, who runs a, a fairly substantial poultry enterprise in the Liverpool Plains, from scanning around, eyeballing the birds to see are they healthy, why are they clustered, is it a temperature issue, is it an illness, to automatic to algorithms that will do that for him and just send alerts. This is the stuff that's coming. That same technology can be in a paddock, a holding paddock, where you've got um, you've got your, um, your your first calf, your calving heifers, basically. Right, or if you're lambing, uh, and it can be used obviously to monitor animals in a captured environment. When it becomes data hungry, it gets hard to move data around, but there are tricks. You can get a lot of the smarts in at the camera itself. So, for example, uh, I'm aware of a team that are working on smart cameras for wild dogs. Okay, so it's like a trail cam, but it does the biometrics on every image of an animal. Okay, what is it? What are the features? Is it a wild dog? Ah, uh, no, it's the damn bitch that's got out of the cage yet again. Um, or it's some warm and fuzzy animal that needs to be protected. Um, and if it is the animal that you don't want on your farm, send you an alert. There is even room, uh, moves afoot to create smart dart systems, which may immobilize the animal so that you do your morning run the next morning and say, yep, that's a keeper in the back of the ute. Ah, uh, that one, I'll let it recover and send it back into the bush. So there's technology that's coming and it's all being done at what we call the edge of cloud at the camera. At the end of the day, when we talk about data and digital, it's more than just the farm. It's about moving that information right through the value chain, through the, the post-harvest technologies, our logistics, our transportation, our exports, uh, or, or domestic markets, into the mouths of our consumers and back. And there is digital technology, blockchain is what we're hearing more and more of. Now, blockchain is a mix of a bubble and a blessing. There are some really cool things blockchain can do, but just be wary, there are things blockchain can't do. So find someone that you trust and take advice on it if you're going that way. I know, for example, James has mentioned a blockchain compatible, compatible system in his. There you go, there's someone we can trust. Find out from him how it works and what the limitations as well as the opportunities are for it. Mobile phone connectivity is really important. It's by far the easiest option for us all. More than half of Australia's farm business rely on it to conduct business. But if you look at a map of Australia, and I've got ignoring Southern WA and Victoria and Tassie, that's a map of all the freehold um, titles around the country intersected with mobile phone infrastructure. You know, two thirds of the farms in our country are within 10 kilometres of some form of mobile phone infrastructure, yet what's our coverage like? Right? So in other words, we have opportunities to utilise that infrastructure better. And it's not just about can you receive it from that tower, what can you do with that tower to be able to receive it on your farm. And Longreach, our region is no different up here. Okay, you know, It's no surprise that the closest proximity to all our mobile phone infrastructure, so this is not a coverage map, this is an access to infrastructure map, is along our major transportation corridors. Out here to the north and the southwest, you know, we don't have infrastructure within 50 kilometres of a farm. But there is a solution out there that we can use. It's not just about beating up the big telcos about mobile phone towers. They are a critical, absolutely critical component of it. But there are farmers that are working with what we call second tier providers to create local solutions. This particular cotton grower west of where I come from invested $40,000 in some local antennas on some various on various towers, created a cell around his farm, and in the very first online auction, which he had, he ran a, he ran a local auction for grain, he had 15 people on the farm and 300 people dialed in via broadband. He paid it off. Okay, so if you want to invest in some of your local augmentation technology to get you to that point of presence reliably so that you're not congested with mobile phone traffic passing through on the roadways and before and after school, then this is something to consider. But having a trusted provider is really important. 
So at the end of the day, look, there's a lot of stuff coming and there's a lot of stuff already in place and there is a lot of stuff that's coming from this region in terms of local innovation that could make a difference not only here but at a much larger scale. Um, it's there, but at the end of the day, it's got to work. It has to work. How many times will we have a crack at something and get knocked back and do it again? So we might have to make sure that we go in step by step. And I guess I just wanted to put one plug up for my own organisation because we're working for you on this. We're working to create what we call an ag tech finder, a one-stop shop digital marketplace. We don't own it. We don't make money out of it. Um, that allows you to go on. You're looking for a weather station. What candidates are out there? Who can I talk to? Who's local? Who's not? Is this stuff that's imported from overseas that doesn't even comply with Australian regulations? Is it weatherproof enough to deal with the heat? Will it handle a UV loading from the New England, for example? So um, I commend you to look for that Ag Tech Finder. It's just being developed and it's an opportunity, like I said earlier, to get in and be a part of the trial and make your own value judgment moving forward. So I guess at the end of the day, if I have a close look at the reason, what are we? I'm a part of this as much as you and I'm a blow-in. You know, are we a food producing region? Are we an ag innovation hub? Are we an outback educational region of excellence, which I'd give a tick? I'd say all three, but uh, let's not wait around for it. I think we have to charge in. Thank you very much.